Hello, my Audioholics friends. It is Friday night. It is 11 p.m. Eastern Time, and we are here once again with Matthew Pose. How you doing, Matthew? I'm good, Gene. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome for a Friday night. And what I would like to do is talk to you about speakers again, because James Larson um, just reviewed a pair of, or actually two pairs of RSL speakers from their new CG series, the CG5s. I believe this is the third generation of speakers that we've covered for RSL, and this is their most ambitious yet. So I wanted to talk to you about this review. Um, the review is live right now on audioholics.com, the editorial site. It's a very comprehensive review with a lot of measurements, a lot of analysis, a lot of recommendations on setup and placement. But it's always good to have something tangible and, and have, um, have the speaker here for everybody to see. And also, Matthew, to get a second opinion, because you have a separate set of ears from James and you got to spend a couple of days listening to these speakers. And I guess I want to hear what your thoughts are um, on these speakers, how they look, how they sound, the value that they offer. Yeah, it was interesting. James, um, I mean, I think everybody probably can tell from our videos, James lives near me and is a friend of mine. Um, and, uh, he told me about these speakers and mentioned, um, some setup issues and all sorts, but he, he said, he's going to drop them off. He brought them over and the review hadn't posted yet. And <clears throat> I kept asking him, like, can I see the measurements? He goes, no, just the, the review will post. You'll see them then just take a listen on your own. So the review took so long to post, I actually ended up having a couple days to listen to them before I ever was able to figure out what James thought about them or how they measured. Right. And when I sat down to listen to them, I actually was pleasantly surprised. I'll admit that I kind of came in with uh, maybe a little bit of a bias. I was expecting not to like them, but uh, they turned out to be a really good speaker. I will say the first thing I noticed, which you can see behind me here, is that they're really attractive. Um, I actually was surprised, especially we, we review a lot of black boxes, you know, and uh, so it was refreshing to have this nice bright white speaker come in. I think the white and black contrast here is really nice. It's a good looking speaker. Do you mind temporarily panning your cam over so we can see the smaller CG5? Because right now all I see is a CG25. Yeah, I think it's uh, because of how this works so here. So there's two models in this lineup, basically. They, they have the CG5, which is, uh, is this a five and a quarter inch woofer or is it? I think so. Now that you ask, I'm not 100% sure, but you that's what? not right. Look at the spec. Yeah, it's a five and a quarter inch woofer. Yeah. I could tell woofer size usually just by looking at a cabinet. That's how nerdy I am. Can you but, see relative to my head? Is there good? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't have that big of a head. No. So, so the CG5 is a two-way with a five and a quarter inch woofer and a one inch uh, soft dome silk tweeter. And then the CG25 is basically two woofers, the same woofers um, in a MTM or Diablito kind of driver configuration. Yeah, it's, it's sold as a... Uh... Uh, the center channel basically to go with these, but it's a bigger speaker. So it actually has a more substantial sound. Right. So before we get into the nuts and bolts, I kind of want to, um, I want to talk a little bit about the company. I'm going to share my screen real quickly here. And it's interesting to note, this is an American based company. Um, it's father and son, actually Joe and, and Howard Rogers. Um, Howard started this company almost 50 years ago. And they took a short hiatus for a while. Then they came back. I, I guess they came back a good six or seven years ago. And they started getting into the speaker business again. And they've been doing really well online. I mean, they are right up there with, you know, like the SVSs and, and you know, the Appearing Audios, those kind of brands. They're very competitive online, uh, not only with their prices, but the quality of their products and their awesome customer service. And they just announced that they're celebrating 50 years with a sale. And it was very interesting because they dropped this sale like right before we were publishing our review. And I was like, James, make sure you factor this in when you when you look at the value and stuff of the products, because right now this is a killer deal. So the CG5 is normally $400, um, $400 each. And now they're 350 each with with free shipping. And then the CG25 normally 500 is 425 each. So for 850 bucks, you're getting a pretty substantial uh, large high output bookshelf speaker that I believe if you match it with a couple of subs, you're looking at getting some high output with low distortion, the kind of stuff that we always talk about, you know, the benefits of having multiple drivers for the mids, like an MTM like this, to be able to control the vertical dispersion by orienting it vertically like this. 
and to get a speaker that just blends well with a, su a high output subwoofer. Yeah, I, I mean, I got to say these speakers, as I mentioned, pleasantly surprised me. So when James brought them over, I didn't bother to look up the price or anything. I mean, I think you guys probably would expect that of reviewers that we would go in at least somewhat blind, not knowing what it is we're looking at, price being one of those factors. So rather than spending a lot of time learning about them, I just set them up and listened. And I had, I don't know why, but I had assumed that they were about twice as expensive as they actually are. So wow. I was nitpicking little details. I was like, you know, it's a nice finish, but it'd be nice if they, like, if you get up close, you can see a little bit of unfinished area inside the uh, slot port here. And the binding posts weren't quite as nice as another speaker we had uh, from Martin Logan that uh, was, you know, just a little bit, ends up being a bit more expensive than these, but I thought they were slightly cheaper than what I thought these were. And then I was talking to James and I said, they seem all right. It seems like they should be a little better for the money. And he goes, well, what do you think they cost? And I'm like, well, aren't they about 2000 a pair? He said, nah, they're like less than half that. Yeah. And the so, Martin Logan's, I, I think the Martin Logan's you were talking about are about 1800 bucks a pair. So that's a, yeah. Right. So that gives you an idea though, when I was comparing speakers, what was going on here. So when we say these are a good value, I thought these were $2,000 a pair and I was nitpicking a little bit. I thought they right. were pretty okay though for that. Given that they're less than half that they're actually a steal. They're really good. They're really well made. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know these guys are really passionate about their speakers. I've been talking to them for many years and, and Howard, for example, shares many of the views we do. They don't like snake oil. You won't see them promoting nonsense with exotic cables or the bouncy house Atmos speakers. You know, they actually have a dedicated Atmos speaker that goes in the ceiling and mm -hmm. uh, it's a really nice product. And their subwoofer, they, they have a Speedwoofer 10S subwoofer. I think it's $400 shipped. It's a 10 inch driver. Pretty high excursion driver. I think it hits our medium basaholic room size rating very comfortably. And um, for $400 each ship, that's one hell of a deal. Yeah. I don't know. We may have measured it in the past. Uh, James has that right now. We were hoping to measure it, but our season ran out for doing outdoor measurements. We have, for those of you who don't know, in the Chicago area, we have snow now. So no yeah. more subwoofer, subwoofer measurements till it warms up. But um, we had talked about that. For a 10 inch subwoofer, it's pretty substantial, it's got a lot of output. It's not going to compete with a you know equally substantial 12 inch sub or anything larger than that, but for right. what it is, it really is a pretty decent sub, and for the price, it's a good value. Yeah, I think it's one of the. I think at the time when we reviewed it, it was one of the best 10 inch subs on the market, especially for that price. I mean, if in order to outperform that in a 10 inch, you got to get a pretty substantial woofer with a lot of power behind it, and it's not going to be 400 dollars. Right, I'm thinking maybe the mono price would have more, but it, it's got a. I don't know what that goes for, but that mono a bigger price. box too. Yeah, it def, it's not a very big sub, so yes, definitely. Yeah. So someone has <clears throat> someone has a question here that I think always comes up when you see a speaker that has a tweeter below the woofer. I'll pop it up, and we actually talk about this in the review, but I'll let you kind of get your impression because you got to listen to it both ways. Yeah. Well. Uh, okay, so first off, is there a benefit? It's a design choice that the uh, the engineer would be making. Um, normally, we would say it shouldn't matter too much. And normally, we would say that you should orient it the way the manufacturer tells you in case it was designed that way. And this one was. But actually, in this particular case, there seems to be a fairly substantial change in the vertical response. And the performance is better when you orient it the other way. So I'm doing it this way because it it looks a little better that way since it was designed to be oriented this way. But um, if you guys do buy the bookshelf, I actually would recommend that you turn it the other way um, with the woofer on the bottom. So a conventional mid mid range on the bottom, tweeter on the top. Yeah, and I'm sure the RSL folks are gonna tell us that's not right. But uh, James did take measurements. That was the only thing he was willing to tell me before I got into listening. Is he told me not to list, not to orient it the way it's supposed to be, and actually flip it. Yeah, um, because it would sound better. And I forgot he told me that. And I was listening for a while and kept noticing that when I sat up and, and you know, got it like right up in my chair, kind of like this versus like this or like laying back more like that, that the, the tonal balance was changing quite a bit. And then I remembered he told me that I switched it around. And then, of course, the article eventually posted and I was able to look and see that sure enough, there's some issues in the measurements. So so I guess to really answer this question what could be a benefit is that you could reduce ceiling reflections by using that orientation with the woofer. Um, in this particular case, I actually think that they've just messed up the response off axis. And so I would just say, switch it around and don't worry about it. So, I mean, maybe if the speaker is really high up towards the ceiling. Yes. If you raise the speaker up higher, um, these are actually studio style speaker stands uh, and they're a right. little high for a normal speaker. Um, 
I think I could have raised these up to that height. You probably you'd need to be up at around 32 to 34 inches to actually make that right and get the right response. Most people put speakers on stands that are between 20 and 24 inches, which if you flip it the other way, would put them at the right height and you'll get good sound. Right. So, yeah, you could do either, I suppose. Okay, so let's let's kind of go over the review a little bit. I'm going to share my screen once again. And, uh, guys, I encourage you to go to audioholics.com. I'll link this up um, in the description video below. But we have... Um, we put a lot of effort into these reviews and I'm not trying to toot yeah. my own horn, but we literally put a lot of blood and sweat. So I hope you guys read the reviews and not just go by what we're saying here on the video, but you can see here, this is used, uh, the CG 25 is in this particular situation is used as a center channel. looks really beautiful. Actually. I, I like that white finish. Yeah. It's, I have to say this trend, it's been, I think a recent thing where we've seen people, um, uh, a lot of industrial design has moved towards brighter looks. And uh, I really do think that the uh, the white um, speaker cabinets are a lot more attractive. I have the other ones I have are the Martin Logans and they're actually white and silver. And I think they're really nice looking too. So yeah. I will say anybody who's watching this video and you're curious what to buy, I really would get the white finish. It's a white gloss finish and it looks really nice. Now these are magnetic grills in there. Are they metal grills? They are. Um, I don't remember what James said, but I would tell you, I have them here somewhere, I think. I would tell you not to use them unless you need to. They are perf perforated metal, and it, yeah. I don't think that those are particularly acoustically transparent. So okay. for, for best, for critical listening, at least, I would take them off. But otherwise, you know, if you, if you don't, I suppose they sound much worse if your kids have poked the tweeter in. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a video on that, guys, and I'll link that up as well. To grill or not to grill. And I always recommend usually recommend the grills off unless you yeah. have a kid or animals or something like that that could damage a tweeter. There are but some it, speakers that are designed to have the grill on and they actually shape the profile of the grill frame to work with it. So if that's true, you know, put the grill on. But these that's not the case. It's, it's just a curved metal right grill. so you know their compression guide technology and their speakers i've always kind of had a, an issue with it i never quite understood the benefit other than maybe it's a little bit more bracing by putting this this baffle in here um you know to me i think you could do most of this just by sticking more insulation in to cancel with the, what, what are they trying to do they're trying to cancel the destructive back waves or something that's what the, the patent seems to suggest that this is focused on the notion of, um, yeah, somehow getting rid of the back wave reflections. It, it, you know, at mid and high frequencies, a very small amount of reflected sound does travel back through the cone, not typically enough to be audible or problematic. And I'm not sure that, you know, in this diagram, what you're seeing there would actually affect that in a beneficial way. It seems to be more about guiding the bass out of the speaker in some way. My guess is this creates actually a resonance. It's probably a two resonant system instead of a, a more typical single resonant system that you would have with a ported design, which would change the bass response. So I think probably most people's question is, did it work? You know, does the bass different? And, you know, it reminded me, and I think one of your other reviewers before, of the H-Pass system, um, which uh, Clemens designed and that that particular system does allow you to have a relatively modest sized bookshelf with a pretty substantial amount of bass. This speaker, there's nothing wrong with the bass, but it's nothing special. You know, it doesn't have any more bass than any other bookshelf speaker that I've used. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would say about it, and I don't know if it's this compression guide technology or something else is that the bass is too elevated. So the tonal balance of the speaker is not bad. It's on the neutral side, but it's kind of on the warm, I'm sorry. It is neutral, but it's kind of on the warm side of neutral with an elevated bass response. And I know some people like that personally. I'm a bit of a bass head and it was too much for me. Well, you know, my theory is anytime you're using a small speaker like this, um, especially in a home theater environment, you're going to bass manage it anyway. It, you're going to cross them over probably around 80 hertz. So probably most of that problem will go away once you put a um, high pass on these speakers and you and you route the the base to the subwoofers. You're probably right. Because it had this technology, I did really want to listen to them without a subwoofer and not base manage so that I could get a good sense of what they were like on their own. Right. Uh, knowing that, of course, we could always change that aspect of the sound. So, you know, I think on their own, I wouldn't expect this to, you know, knock you out base wise, but it's not bad. It definitely was decent. Yeah. So this is interesting. On the CG5s, there is a 
kind of a dial here to, to pad down the tweeter, which is yeah. not on the CG25. And my understanding is the CG25, because it has dual woofers in parallel, you have more sensitivity in the woofers and it keeps up with the tweeter. And in this case, with just the one woofer and the one tweeter, they had to put a little pad here. Um, if, it, if the speaker sounded a little bright, you could shelve it yeah. down by selecting low, or if you want a little bit more treble, you could go to high. Well, you know the severe mental illness, audio, uh, audio nervosa? <laughs> yeah. That's what this is good for. I played around with it for a while, and it doesn't make a huge difference. I think it's great that they included it, I suppose, but... Uh, uh, in the end, probably most people are going to find a setting they like and leave it at that. I typically found that the middle setting was fine. And maybe if you're putting these behind an, an acoustically transparent screen or or something like that, then you'd want to set it to the high setting just to get a little bit more treble output. Yeah, I could see that. So one thing I'll point out is that that's a, that's a really nice cast frame woofer. So again, in this price class, we don't typically see speakers using woofers quite that nice. Yeah, not never. There's other speakers, yeah. similar price that have good woofers, but certainly that is a good quality driver that they've used. So they didn't, they didn't cheap out there. Yeah. And it's interesting because it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a vented pole piece, but they do vent the spider. What's that? Mm -hmm. That's just an alternative way of doing it, right? Well, it means that, um, I guess I, is, they definitely didn't vent the pole piece. I can't tell. It, it doesn't look like there's up. a, um, there's a hole in there. It's just, that looks like it's solid. You could be right. I didn't look at it. We could ask James, I suppose. But yeah, so basically, if you vent under the spider like that, that's a good way of venting some of the heat and the compressed compression, like there's a sort of compressed air, if you will, that builds up underneath the spider in uh, the drivers around the outside of the voice coil area. The vented pull piece allows you to actually vent more of the inside area. Um, right. So sometimes you see both. But yeah, I mean, this is fine, too. And the yeah, air that's nice. inside the coil still comes out. Right. It's a nice, I mean, it's a nice cabinet. It's, it's well stuffed yeah. too. So we were mm -hmm. talking about stuffing the cabinet to reduce those back waves. They already have good stuffing in there. Yeah, it really is a well finished, well made enclosure. The speaker drivers are good quality for the price of the speaker. I mean, I was really impressed by that. As I said, I thought these were actually about twice as expensive as they were. And if they were, I would have nitpicked a little. I mean, that's a really decent crossover there. It's not too, it's not overly complex. And for the it's price. It's a real crossover. I mean, we've seen speakers that, you know, that are 500 bucks a pair that only have a couple of resistors and a capac a series capacitor on the tweeter. These actually have Mylar caps. They have mm -hmm. air core inductors. They're orthogonally located. So they're not, you know, interfering with each other. Yeah. I mean, those are nice air core inductors. Those are good uh polymetallized caps of some type uh I'm, the resistors i believe are underneath it but you know basically that's a decent enough crossover for a speaker in this price range the parts quality is actually better than what we typically see in this price range so that's good you notice the caps are five percent tolerance and they're 250 volt yeah these are good parts for sure and yeah. we, and we don't see actually parts that good typically on speakers of this price point. And that that's an important thing to know because we've taken apart speakers in the past and the devil's in the details, um, mm -hmm. even from big companies. And you look at the parts and they have 10% uh, parts or they're 150 volt or 125 volt. So that means they don't handle as much power. And then when you have higher tolerance on the parts, that means that, you know, the speaker consistency from speaker to speaker is not going to be as tight. Yeah, and actually, I've done some experimentation with this before. Um, you know, being having audio nervosa, uh, being a good audio holic. I when I built my main speakers, but also in some other projects I did, I played around with parts that were all the right values. But basically, what I did was I measured their exact value because, as you mentioned, they have five percent tolerances. The inductors actually typically are closer to ten percent. Um, and I sorted them and then I built crossovers and, and tested the transfer function of the crossover. So I didn't measure the speaker per se. I just looked at what the crossover response was like. And um, it's actually the tolerance of the part matters, but also the matching of the part that those small differences can make a fairly sizable difference in the overall transfer function. And there's certain areas where it matters more. So when you see companies that are using worse parts with like 10 or even sometimes 20% tolerances, that actually can lead to speakers that don't match each other very well. Yeah. And that can have a dramatic effect on the quality of the, of the sound stage. And, you know, to that, I will say these imaged really well, they had a very solid center image and a, and a nice deep sound stage. And that's again because the speaker is probably measured very similarly. If you took, you know, the left, the right, left and the right, yeah, yeah, they should have. 
So we should look at these measurements now. I mean, of course, you see how James measures, and I think it's important for people to recognize the level of sophistication in our measurement approach as compared to that of others. Not only do we use high quality uh, microphones, but James has constructed, as we've mentioned before, this custom measurement rig that allows him to place the speakers way up in the air. Right. And uh, what that does is it allows us to avoid ground reflections, which outside would be the only reflection to corrupt the measurement. And then the speaker is on a stand that can rotate the speaker. And then we take our measurements in five degree increments around the horizontal axis and 10 degree increments in the vertical axis uh, in order to construct these graphs that you see. And, and this is really the only right way to do that. And his microphone stand, you'll see that giant pole that's hanging out. That's because the only way to keep the microphone stand from corrupting the measurement is to have a really long uh, uh, stand like that. So it is like over 70 measurements here just to come up with this, um, basically these response curves, right? Yeah, and if a speaker has an asymmetric design that requires, then you have to double the number of measurements. So we have to take a lot of measurements to do this. And all I can say is, thankfully, these are symmetric speakers. So yeah, I do want to look at these, though. So one of the things I want to point out is that, as I mentioned, I listened to the speakers and I was nitpicking the sound a little bit. I hadn't seen the measurements yet, but I kept saying, you know, there's something going on in the lower kind of middle mid-range area it sounded a little colored to me and i and i don't want to overstate this i don't want people to think that they actually sound bad they really are a nice pleasant sounding speaker but that ridge that you can see i mean what is that around it's about 750 hertz. seven yeah okay so that ridge is audible and and i don't want to you know suge suggest to folks that we didn't hear you know what we saw in the measurements i did and uh Gene, you probably remember, you were asking me what they sounded like before the review had posted. And I said, they're good. There's a little bit of coloration in them, the, it's in the bass and in the lower mid-range. But otherwise, they're pretty good. And uh, sure enough, when I finally saw these measurements, I thought, well, apparently my ears, ears aren't broken because I, I definitely heard that. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I think people that have very sensitive hearing, uh, you know, may notice that. But I, I'll just say, compared to other speakers we've measured for this kind of money, they... All speakers are compromised in some way. Yeah. This particular one has a little bit of a coloration that I didn't find particularly bothersome. I think there's other speakers for the same money that have their own colorations and their own problems. Uh, the other thing, as I said, you can see that the base is elevated in this. It should be flatter than that. Um, it, it's kind of shelved up, and it should actually be down probably at least three decibels. I think, to be honest, there's some people like that, and that's the way they voice speakers. Yep. It's not More exactly impact. neutral. More yeah. Impact to the sound. Yeah. So, so what's interesting, what I find interesting looking at the CG5 graph versus the CG25, I'm not going to zoom in because I want you guys to look at them directly. They look very similar. For a mm -hmm. speaker that's an MTM versus an MT, these response curves are pretty strikingly similar. They are. And this, you know, we always tell people, sorry, one of the worst uh, MTM designs are when the tweeter is right in the middle uh, for using as a center channel because it tends to exacerbate the lobing. Well, wait till you see the polar response on these. There was no lobing. Like, there was no issue. They they do met their voice the same. Yeah. They even have the same coloration in them. But, you know, that's that's just another thing when you're when you're a family business like, like Joe and um, Howard. Um, these guys are meticulous. They do, you know, when I spoke to them on the last series of speakers, they went through a long process of picking drivers. I mean, this mm -hmm. is stuff that you don't do when you're in a large corporation necessarily, and you're trying to meet shareholder, um, you know, promises to get products out in time. I know these guys, when they release a new product, it, they spend their time kind of testing everything out to making sure everything matches. And, and you could see it here. I mean, I'm just, I'm surprised to see an MTM and an MT have such similar response characteristics. I mean, that's just, that's impressive to me. Yeah, they, they voice them very similarly. So uh, if you look at these charts here, if you click on, uh, I believe it's the right one would be the MTM. Yeah, the CG25. Yeah, so you can see that there's no holes. So if this had a lobing problem, somewhere in that graph, we would see off to the sides a hole on both sides, uh, basically like a dip, a black hole, if you will, in the response. Yeah. And that would be the sign of lobing. And you can see that the response actually remains pretty flat and even. It doesn't even fall off that much to the sides, which means that the speaker actually has fairly wide, even dispersion, and there is no real lobing issues at all. 
Is this measured vertically? Uh, this should be horizontal, right? Oh, it is horizontal. Okay. Yeah. But. Yeah. Okay. And then we should have the verticals as well. Um, you know, I probably should have there, this. right there. So then we can see. So we do so in the horizontal. There's no lobing issues. They they measure right. You do see the vertical lobing. Sorry, I missed that. Okay. Uh, so the alien graph. If you look down farther, we can see the the alien graph. There we go. Well, this is typical with any speaker that's it is. horizontally mounted. And this isn't terrible. Yeah, it looks like an alien graph. We like to make fun of these when we see them. It that's yeah. so you can see those two blue spots that are on either side in symmetric uh, placement there. That's that's lobing. Yeah. Uh, this isn't particularly bad, but it does show that the response changes in the vertical axis. Is, and this is the 25? Yeah, it is. Okay. I mean, that's pretty far off axis, too. You're not going to typically be sitting that far off axis. from this. No. Point. For normal use, it should be fine. Yeah. yeah but... I, I have a whole article about that, guys. If you're doing an MTM, you know, you want to stay within a 20 to 30 degree listening window. Horizontal. Yeah. When they're laid horizontal. Yeah. Oh, and then this we can see the actual lobing in this. Now we can see the hole. So I apologize for what I said earlier. I was I hadn't looked at this apparently carefully. Um, but yeah, so if you see those two holes on each side, that kind of uh, that's the lobing effects that you would see in the response of the speaker. So that's if you place the speaker in the uh, sideways position so that the woofer is on either side of the tweeter instead, as you would as a center channel. Yeah, if yeah. you get far enough off axis, you're going to start to see this hole in the response. And it would be audible more than likely. But as you mentioned, that's actually pretty far off axis. So where that could be an issue would be if you're sitting very close. So if your listening distance is something like two to two and a half meters, yeah, OK, you might run into some issues for those like mother-in-law seats. Yep. Yeah, obviously the person in the middle, no problem at all. If you're actually sitting though closer to three, you know, three meters or more, um, you shouldn't have any issues. I think all the seats should fall into a decent, decent range. Yeah. So here we go again. We see the um, this is a CG five. This is this is when you um, this is the measurement you were talking about when the tweeters on the bottom and the woofers on the top, right? Right. So you can see that as you move off axis and the vertical angle, the response starts to change dramatically. And as I said, that's very audible. Now, I mean, looking at that, you would think that should be audible. You'd be deaf if you couldn't hear that. Yeah. Um, so I found that it was pretty critical to get the MT, uh, the, I'm sorry, the MT speaker at the right height. And it was easier to get them at the right height and avoid that hole in the response if you just uh, placed the speaker so that the woofer was on the bottom. Gotcha. But as you mentioned, you could actually place the speaker higher and avoid it. Yeah. So guys, if you're if you're getting the CG five um, oriented normally, like a mid mid range on the bottom, tweeter on the top, if you're sitting at ear level um, with the mid range or the tweeter, but if you're putting these up really high towards the ceiling, then obviously flip it and put the woofer on the top and the tweeter on the bottom, kind of angle them down at you. So the impedance uh, with these rated with these rated six or eight ohms, they say recommend impedance a spec of six or eight ohms, whichever is higher. I mean, this is a pretty easy uh, load to drive here. It doesn't dip below a, a five some five ohms, so this is a comfortably a six ohm speaker for sure. And you can see that there's nothing in that impedance. Uh, plot that would suggest any design issues either. I mean, you've got uh, the, the phase angles are always uh, decent, uh, you know, at the low impedance points. Um, the uh, There's no ripples in it, which would be a sign of a resonance or a problem in the speaker. I mean, everything is nice. So that, again, a good sign of a, of a decently designed speaker. Yep, it's clean. And then even the CG5, CG25, which has the dual woofers in it, the impedance, they still maintain a good minimum impedance of 5 ohms. So it's not a hard load to drive, even with the extra woofer on it. Yeah, yeah, it's decent. Looks like it's tuned at around 50 hertz or so. So, I mean, you get a decent amount of bass. But again, guys, if you're buying these speakers, I would mate them with two Speedwoofer 10Ss. And you would have a killer system that's capable of some pretty high output into a medium to large size room. 
Yeah, I'm sure RSL is going to appreciate the upsell on the subs, but I will say the the TM or MT speaker, uh, the smaller of the bookshelves, the CG5, probably you could get away with a uh, single 10-inch subwoofer. But, oh, I just realized that both of our videos don't seem to be working right, or at least Mine's on my end. Mine's working. You're, you're frozen again. Oh, it's showing something else on my end. Sorry, guys. Let me try to unfreeze that real quick. So let's see if we have a question here. So an MMT or TMM or even a rare T better than it. Oh, you never want to do the tweeter mid mid tweeter. That's there's only like one brand left that's still doing those designs and they're I just do not recommend that kind of speaker. It's atrocious for anybody that's that's sitting anywhere but the center, the acoustic center of the speaker. So just stay away from those kind of designs. That's why nobody does them. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, really, what's the best if you're going to have a horizontally... Or, so what's the best, as we mentioned in our last video, is actually to have an identical speaker oriented in an identical fashion in the center, which means you have to have an acoustically transparent uh, screen. And yeah. that's not an option for a lot of people. So if you have to have a um, horizontally oriented center channel, then... Really, the MTM is still the best of the options. The MMT or TMM type approach actually would put you too far. It wouldn't be symmetric for the listeners basically anymore. The TMMT actually causes really uh, horrible uh, problems. So you're saying, does it does it solve the lobing issue? No, it's the worst. <laughs> well, so, yeah, so it solves the lobing issue by creating severe interference effects instead. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, you, I suppose... You cure the patient by killing him. Yeah. Um, so what's a better approach is actually a couple things. One is you can place the woofers very close together and then nest the tweeter. So like imagine these woofers here are pushed together and this tweeter, instead of being right in the middle here, is actually pushed up and nestled between them. That's one way to address this issue. It reduces the lobing effect. Or you can put a mid-range here. The tweeter goes up higher and then the woofers are uh, actually usually have to be pushed out a little bit. That yeah. doesn't totally get rid of the lobing problem, but it's better, and you get a, a better response with that over a wider number of seats. So those that's would called, be the best option. That's called a WTMW, which is you see in a lot of those kind of designs. The only downside on a WTMW versus an MTM is you. I think you lose a little dynamic range if the mid-range is really small because now with that speaker, you have two five and a quarters doing the mids, if you were going to put a dedicated mid under that tweet, it would probably be only a three and a half, four inch woofer. The sensitivity is going to be lower. So I think overall you might lose some dynamic range to fix a lobing problem. That might not be a problem unless you're sitting really close to the speaker. So for most instances, when you're sitting, you know, a good eight to 10 feet away from your center channel and you're not more than 20 degrees off axis an MTM works just fine. Yeah, they really are typically uh, fine. You know, I mean, I, this is coming from somebody who actually doesn't love the horizontally uh, oriented MTM uh, center channels. So I think for most people, they really are fine. Um, my experience having used every kind of center channel there is uh, in terms of design approach, uh, ultimately, I ended up going to three identical speakers and an acoustically transparent screen. Um, so I, it's, it's, a tr it's a compromise. There's always compromises. As I said, every speaker is compromised in some way. Every system is compromised in some way. And you just have to choose which compromises you're willing to make. Yeah. So I think that trying to go to something like a TMM or a TMMT is a significantly worse compromise to make over just going to a normal MTM. So I guess the last question I have for you on these speakers, you, you'd listen to the CG5s, you listen to the CG25s. Which did you prefer for two-channel music? the CG25s. So yeah. we found this a few times now too. I think that the greater impact, if you will, the, the greater kick yeah, to the mid bass, uh, the higher output abilities uh, made that a better sounding speaker. This isn't always true though. You know, I had those Ravels in the room uh, before that we were listening to that James also had reviewed. And they mentioned that they were really excellent. They were just a normal tweeter uh, mid bass type speaker. And uh, I thought they sounded good. I think, you know, they're more expensive, but they did sound better than these. Um, well, they were four grand a pair. So yeah. I said, yeah, they're more expensive. <laughs> so the point is that isn't always true, but it, it, we've noticed uh, there was some Dayton, uh, I think it was the, what were they called? M MK442 or something like that. Yeah, and the 402 yeah. we listened to and we thought, it's all right, it's a cheap speaker. And then we listened to the 442 and this actually sounds really good. So when James uh, brought these in and I was listening to them, 
You know, I thought that the CG5 sounded really decent for the money, but I actually was most impressed with the CG25. And I would say anybody with a room that's kind of in the mid-sized room, you know, we we have subwoofer ratings. We kind of uh, discuss the different sized rooms. So I'd say if you've got like a mid-sized room, you're really going to prefer the CG25. If you've got a larger room, you're going to need the CG25 just to get by. If you've got a smaller room, this is probably fine. You know, I could definitely see this in like a bedroom system or, you know, any room where your, your wall dimensions are maybe on the order of like 10 to 15 feet, you know, each. Yeah. No, I mean, guys, imagine um, getting three of those uh, CG25s up front and then a pair of the CG5s in the back and then two Speedwoofer 10Ss. You got yourself a pretty killer system uh, for a Absolutely. very reasonable price. Yeah. I mean, of course, we would prefer that they have four of the Speedwoofer 10s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad uh, we got two ears or two pairs of ears on these speakers, both yourself and James Larson. That um, That's a good endorsement to have two of our reviewers that are very critical about loudspeakers, basically saying that these RSLs are a good value. In fact, Matt saying that the CG25s he thought were double the retail price. So that speaks volumes, guys. I mean, I think it's a great buy, especially now with their discount, their their um, slight discount for their 50th anniversary. And you get free shipping and you get a 30-day trial period. So if you don't like the speakers for whatever reason after 30, you know, within 30 days, you get a full refund on them. So that's that's a great way for you to basically try the speakers out in your own environment to make sure that they're appropriate for your listening conditions and for your room, your room acoustics. Yeah, I mean, I think these are a great speaker. Uh, I definitely recommend people if they're in the market for a speaker in that price point, uh, price point, take a look at these. I think they're a good value. They look really nice. They're well, the the industrial design is good. The engineering is good. Good product. And listen to them with the grills off if you can. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Matt, for uh, giving us your feedback on these speakers. Guys, if you like this video, please thumb it up, share it. Um, YouTube's policy lately is is really been favoring the big corporations. So if you don't get a lot of likes and shares and comments, we need the comments down below. Um, the traffic just falls off on the videos. So please tell us what you think about RSL speakers. Are you considering getting you know these kind of speakers in your home theater? What are you running right now? I'd like to know. Join our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. You get unique content there that goes live before it goes on YouTube or the Audioholics editorial site. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.